we have a very, very dear friend of ours uh, at, here at FOSI um, who is going to come to uh, introduce her latest research. And any of you who's been to a FOSI conference before knows that we really, really uh, emphasize the research because we want to be evidence-based approach in everything that we do. Uh, she is a senior research scientist at the AP NORC Center for Public Affairs Research and a researcher at the Data and Society Research Institute. Um, many of you will remember her for her 16 years, is it really 16 years? At the Pew Research Center, where she undertook groundbreaking studies on teens, technology, and this ever-changing landscape. Please join me in welcoming Amanda Lenhart. All right, hello, hello. So. We're going to be very cool with our technology today. So if I have slides that I'll be presenting because I have a lot of data and I think that's generally an easier way for us to talk through. But they're not going to display on the screen. So if you want to look at the slides, you'll need to pull it up on the app. So bring, this is a real, this is, you can actually look at your phone without guilt during my presentation. So let's go, let's go, let's take this opportunity. So um, today I'm going to be talking about the research I released uh, last Monday. Um, on online harassment, digital abuse, and cyberstalking in America today. And it's actually the 47% statistic um, uh, that uh, the ambassador mentioned is, in fact, from, from that report. Um, and so the first, so for, page forward to the first slide, um, and you can see that, in fact, 47% of online Americans ages 15 and older um, have experienced at least one type of online harassment. And in this study, and I should back up for a second and say this study was a nationally representative uh, piece of research. It was done on uh, cell phones and landlines um, with 3,002 Americans. Um, and we specifically included adolescents, um, which if any of you know research, know that that sort of ups the difficulty level of the research process um, sort of exponentially. But we included 15, 16, and 17-year-olds in the research, um, partly because of the work I'd done before that had shown um, that there is some sort of relationship and, and, and certainly abuse and experiences with harassment that youth, that teens are experiencing. So, so this study, um, this, the data that I'm presenting today is all from that study. Um, and as I said, 47% of online Americans, 15 and older, have experienced at least one type of online harassment. Uh, and in our study, we actually um, asked about 20 different types of online harassment, 20 different particular experiences. And we can go through some of them, and you'll see some of them in my slides if you're looking at them. Um, but it turns out that there are some really important differences um, it, with different groups when we're looking at online harassment. Um, and so the first main difference, which I think is actually really quite important, and one which is a thread that we'll see throughout almost all the data that I'll talk about today, is that younger people, people 15 to 29, anybody under 30, are essentially much more likely to experience online harassment, to witness online harassment, and to experience a lot of the negative repercussions from that harassment. Um, and in fact, if you see on the slide um, that you can see, internet users um, 15 to 29 are more likely to experience a couple of different types of harassment. And so we actually had so many different categories, so many different types of harassment that we asked about that we put them into three categories. So the first type is we call it direct harassment. This is more of our kind of catch-all grouping. Um, it includes things like being called offensive names, having somebody uh, try to embarrass you online. So potentially relatively mild, depending on the context. Uh, and then goes on to um, having someone encouraging others to harass you, which is sometimes known as brigading. Um, being physically threatened online, being sexually harassed online, uh, being harassed through impersonation. Uh, being cyberstalked, which in our definition involves being contacted online in way, repeatedly in a way that makes you feel afraid for your safety. Um, we also have a category which we call invasion of privacy. This is another mode uh, that we see of online harassment where um, somebody actually uh, accesses information about you and potentially reveals it in a way that compromises your safety um, and has other impacts on you personally or professionally or financially. Um, this can include things like just simply monitoring your online or phone activity so the person knows where you are and what you're doing. Um, having somebody read your texts or emails without permission. Uh, having someone misuse content of yours that you've posted on social media. Um, having your password stolen or coerced from you, potentially by perhaps a romantic partner or by someone else. 
um, and literally just being monitored, having somebody uh, use GPS or other tracking software um, to find where you are in space, whether that's because they're enabling something, you've enabled something on your uh, various social media devices, whether somebody has actually put a tracking device on you, which certainly happens, or whether somebody is uh, using your mobile phone in certain ways to track you. Um, so as I said, it turns out that younger users, ages 15 to 29, are much more likely to experience um, many kinds of direct harassment and types of invasion of, invasion of privacy type harassment than older adults. And the real takeaway for me from this finding is that the, what, what we see on the internet is really different depending on how old you are. Your kinds of experiences online are really different depending on how old you are. If you are older and you think, you know what, I don't think this is really a big deal, I don't see a lot of it in my networks, that's because you don't see, there's less of it, it potentially in your networks if you are 30 and older uh, than if you are a young adult. And so I think we do need to be thinking about what that means in terms of the kinds of experiences and what people see and what they experience in these online spaces for our young people today. The next major finding of this report, which I think is really quite fascinating but requires us to kind of dig deeper into the numbers, is that men and women are actually equally likely to have experienced at least one type of harassment. But when we go a little deeper, we see that the kinds of harassment that men and women experience are very, very different. Uh, that they're more likely to experience and their experiences of that harassment are quite different. Their perceptions of that harassment are quite different. Um, so it turns out men are more likely to experience the direct harassment that we talked about, um, being called offensive names, having somebody try to embarrass you online, being physically threatened online. Men are also um, like more likely to experience the third type of harassment, which is denial of access. And these are really technical attacks. These are where somebody does a DDoS attack on you, uh, where somebody uh, overwhelms your um, instant messenger by, or your messaging s systems or services by sending you in an overwhelming number of messages so that you literally cannot use the platform. Um, and there's a number of other ones, uh, but denial of access is kind of our third type of online harassment. And that's, for men, men are more likely to experience these denial of service attack types of, uh, of harassment online. Women are more likely to experience what I would describe as a longer duration, potentially more severe, and with gr types of harassment with sort of greater life repercussions. Um, women are more likely to be sexually harassed. They're more likely to have rumors spread about them online, to be harassed over a long period of time, to be stalked online, and to have someone try to harm them in person after being harassed in an online space. Women are also more likely to have sensitive personal information exposed in a way that harms them personally, professionally, or financially. Um, and they're also more likely to have information posted to social media that makes, them, uh, that makes you uncomfortable. So the differences that we see between men and women are really uh, in the nature and the types of the kinds of harassment that they experience. It also turns out that when you combine these two factors, it's really young women, young women in America who are really bearing the brunt of this online harassment. So women ages 15 to 29 are more likely to experience than younger men, older men, and older women being sexually harassed, having someone try to harm them in person after being, harmed, after being harassed online, being harassed over a long period of time, being stalked, and having their sensitive information exposed. And so and I think we need to really think about, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about repercussions from that, what choices women are making and what kinds of actions women are taking um, in response to this. The other information that I haven't actually included in my slides today, partly for time, but which I wanna make sure we all acknowledge, is that the other big theme throughout this data is that lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals are much more likely to experience and to witness and to have all of the negative repercussions that we'll talk about from online harassment. It's stark, it's uh, shocking. Um, I definitely suggest that you look at the data in the report, um, particularly if, um, you know, I think particularly if these are populations you work directly with, but even if they aren't. Um, so that's another thread and theme that I, I have not included in the slides today, but which I wanna make sure we mention. So every time you hear me say young people, young women, you should also be thinking lesbian, gay, and bisexual, because that information essentially is a sidecar and, uh, and very much parallels those other findings. Um, and as I said, so we've talked about that young women and, um, and young people are more likely, and lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals are more likely to experience all of these types of harassment. Um, but it turns out their experiences of that harassment are very different. Um, so moving on to the next slide, women are more likely than men to say that they were er made angry, worried, or scared 
because of the abuse that they experienced. Um, uh, in particular, um, it's uh, particularly scared. About 32% of women who had experienced some kind of harassment said they felt scared because of it. Only about 11% of men who had also experienced harassment said the same thing. Um, so really, the, partly it's, I think we see that it, the types of harassment that women are experiencing is really quite different. Um, but also the, their literal experiences of the harassment are different. Um, and the same thing continues when we actually, we actually look at whether or not the, those who've experienced behaviors that we as researchers think are online harassment actually believe that that's what they're experiencing, right? So one of the things that happened in this study is we did a bunch of pretests, and in the pretests we learned, um, partly because of how we had initially designed the survey, that a lot of people don't actually think that some of these behaviors that we're talking about constitute harassment. And so we ended up, we would hear on these uh, interviews, people be like, well, no, it was just a joke. It was, I wasn't, we, no, I know it wasn't, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't answer this question. And so I think that's actually a really important point. And we actually see this in the data to a certain extent because what we ended up doing is going in and adding a question, which is, do you feel that what you experienced was online harassment or abuse? And it turns out not everybody thinks that, but the differences are really different between men and women. So men are just less likely to believe that what they experienced in, these online, in this online harassment moment was harassment or abuse. Now again, part of it is that we see what they actually are more likely to experience are different and potentially, depending on the context, um, more mild than what women are more likely to experience. Um, but nevertheless, I think we have this sense also that literally how people experience the same thing really is, is quite different depending on who you are, where you are, what is your, who are you in the world? What is your experience of power in, in life, right? Do you feel that you're a powerful person? Are you somebody who generally is able to do the things that you want? Or are you worried about your safety? Are you worried about being subject to people more powerful than you? And I think we see these dynamics playing out in this harassment, uh, in this, in these harassment data. Moving on to the next slide, I think it's also really important for us to talk about seeing it, right? So it's not just that about half of Americans experience online harassment, it's that nearly three quarters actually witness it. They see it happening to someone else, right? And this, it turns out, actually has implications in some of the outcomes because um, when you see harassment, you are actually more likely to engage in some of the behaviors that we'll talk about at the end around not putting your voice, not sharing your thoughts online. Um, when we look at who witnesses harassment, again, it's the same story that we've seen before. It's much more likely to be young people, lesbian, gay, um, and uh, uh, bisexual individuals. Also, um, young women in particular, uh, sorry, young women in particular. But also, we see um, black internet users, and to a lesser extent, Hispanic internet users are also more likely to see certain types of online harassment than white users. We don't actually see that in other parts of the data. Um, some of that may be because even with the large sample size that we had, the uh, sample size is actually still quite small when it comes to people of color in our study, and so it may be that we're not, sample size isn't large enough to be seeing some of these differences in other places. But I really wanna get onto what I think is in some ways the most important finding of the study, which is that almost a quarter of people in America, regardless of whether or not they have seen harassment, regardless of whether or not they have experienced harassment, say that they have not posted something online out of fear of being harassed because of what they posted. Turns out that if you have experienced harassment, you are substantially more likely to say that. Turns out if you're a woman, you're substantially more likely to say that. If you're a young woman, you're substantially more likely to say that. Um, it turns out if you've even witnessed harassment, you're more likely to say that you have self-censored yourself, you have silenced yourself. Um, out of concerns of harassment. And I think this comes back to what the ambassador was saying about our concerns about people simply not even adding their voices into the broader national, international conversation about important issues because they're afraid of being attacked. They're afraid of what might, uh, might come forward. Now, I think it's perfectly fair to say like, hey, maybe people are thinking like, maybe I shouldn't post that racist meme and because people are gonna harass me, which is entirely true. And that's certainly maybe something of what we're picking up here. But I think if you back up and you look at the demographics of the people who are saying this and the kinds of experiences that they have, I think it's clear to me that what we're actually seeing is a suppression of voice based on people who have experience or seen other people like them experience online harassment. So, so I also wanna talk a little bit about 
the kinds of strategies that um, people who have experienced harassment use to protect themselves, right? So we know there's a, there's a bunch of harms that come from harassment. I would actually, again, commend you to look at the report. We go into detail about some of the kinds of experiences and things that happen to people who are victimized by online harassment. But I want to talk about things that are a little bit more empowering, which is what do victims do? So what steps do they take to try to protect themselves from this? Um, because victims aren't passive, right? They are survivors in many cases. They are taking steps to try to protect themselves. Um, and 65% of victims have tried to do something to protect themselves. Uh, about 43% have changed their contact information, whether that's changing their email address, creating new social media profiles, changing their telephone number, um, in some cases even uh, moving or changing their addresses. Um, about a third have asked for help, and in this category we include things like asking friends or family for help, um, getting a restraining order or a protection order against your harasser, um, and also getting help from a domestic violence center, hotline, or organization. About 27% um, reported the content about themselves, uh, flagged some kind of content that was posted that they objected to. So, you know, proactively engaging with um, that, uh, trying to remove the content that was problematic. Um, and about another quarter disconnected from networks or devices. So said, you know what, I'm done. I gotta stop using social media. I am going to stop going online and I'm gonna stop using my cell phone. Um, again, cell phone use, it's only about 4% of people, victims who said they did that. Um, but about 20% uh, about say that they stopped using social media and about 13% said they stopped going online. And so I wanna talk a little, I, mean, I think we need to think through some of the implications of these, right? So, so on one level, this is empowering because Victims can take charge of their lives and say, you know what, we've got, we've got these things that I can do to kind of help myself and protect myself. But if we think about the further implications of this, many of these things are taking these people away from their networks of support, places where they do business, the places where they can engage, where they can have conversation, where they can connect with their friends and family. So there's a lot of different reasons why even these actions that you're taking to protect yourself are actually really detrimental to the people who experience this. They isolate them, it disconnects them from people who could support them and, uh, and from opportunities to sort of share their thoughts and experiences. I wanna end on a positive note. Um, the one, I think the one um, little glimmer of hope in the report um, is that we asked people who had witnessed harassment whether they had taken one of three actions to respond to, to that harassing experience that they witnessed. And it turns out about 65% of 63% of online Americans who've witnessed harassment have done at least one of three things. Um, most of them said something to the person who was targeted, um, hopefully something supportive, we don't know exactly what. Uh, another 40% actually said something to the person or people who were perpetrating uh, the harassment. Uh, and about 38% reported or flagged this behavior through the online platforms. Um, that they witnessed it in. Now, we don't know, there's a lot of kind of context around these things. We don't, many people don't know necessarily. You see something, you witness something, and you're not that close to the people involved. You don't really know the context. There's a lot of reasons why it may be difficult to do some of these things, but I think um, witnesses in general should be applauded for being the bystanders that um, this data suggests that they are. And with that, I will say thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. If there's not time, then <laughs> on we go. So thank you so much.